starts now. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Quentin Smith. President Trump is back in Washington after a quick trip to the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. But even while he was on the world stage, the president was still focused on what was going on in the Senate floor. CBS's Ben Tracy has the latest from the White House. We have a great case. Before leaving the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, President Trump said there's somewhere else he'd like to be. Would you please be seated? Front and center at his impeachment trial. I'd love to go. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be beautiful? I don't know. I'd sort of love to sit right in the front row and stare at their corrupt faces. The president gave his own attorneys rave reviews and then unloaded on House managers, Democrats Adam Schiff and Jerry Nadler. These two guys, these are major sleazebags. They're very dishonest people. Mr. McConnell. Despite Republican efforts to block witnesses, President Trump claims he'd love to see testimony from current and former members of his administration, including former advisor John Bolton. But Mr. Trump said national security concerns, particularly in Bolton's case, make that unlikely. He knows some of my thoughts. He knows what I think about leaders. Uh, what happens if he reveals what I think about a certain leader and it's not very positive? I don't know if we left on the best of the terms. I would say probably not. Back in the U.S., the president's campaign manager, Brad Parscale, told CBS this morning impeachment is helping Mr. Trump's reelection bid. There's millions now that are engaged to show up. And I will tell you, the president has a larger base now significantly than 2016. As for the president actually showing up at his own impeachment trial, Republican Senator John Cornyn says the president should focus on other business. But Republican Senator Rand Paul says he may send a ticket over here to the White House just in case the president wants to use it. Ben Tracy, CBS News, the White House. For right now, President Trump is keeping to his planned appearances. He's scheduled to attend the March for Life in Washington on Friday. Right now we have temperatures in the 30s and low 40s out there. 41 in Tupelo, 39 in Columbus and Eupora. A little bit warmer this evening than what we were thinking. So uh, that's all because of these clouds we have out there. You can see the clouds rolling out into the region earlier today with our Alp insurance camera time lapse from downtown Tupelo. Now, it looks like we have a force field right over our area. Rain has been trying to move on in all day long. We still have a lot of dry air in place, but the atmosphere is moistening up, and we do envision a chance for some rain uh, tomorrow morning as you head out the door. Let's open up the door again. There we go. Go outside. Uh, we're looking at temperatures in the upper 30s to around 40. Uh, have the umbrella ready to go for the morning commute because, yes, we are looking at some rain showers here, pockets of heavier rain during the day, temperatures in the 40s. I'm back with a full forecast, Quentin, in just a few minutes. All right, thank you so much, Keith. Mississippi requires high schoolers to take four subject area tests, English, algebra, biology, and U.S. history. Of those four, the U.S. history test is the only one that's not required by the federal government or state law. Several people are now working to, working to find a way to scrap that test, but as Courtney Ann Jackson explains, the recent attempts are hitting a roadblock. The question of whether students are tested too much generates a lot of feedback, and those concerns made it all the way through one process only to be stopped at the end. Representative Tom Miles has made those public outcries part of the conversation at the Capitol in recent years. The students don't want it, the principals don't want it, but Mississippi Department of Education, they seem to think they know better than teachers that are actually in the classroom every day. Miles is referring to the testing task force that was formed. They polled teachers to find out if they thought the U.S history test should stay as a graduation requirement. Task Force member Kelly Riley. I think a lot of educators feel like their concerns have simply been swept aside. You know, multiple surveys repeatedly showed that basically a three to one response was eliminate the assessment. It's not necessary. Um, it'll free up funds, it'll lessen the, the focus and the stress related to assessments. So we asked, what's next? Myself and several other legislators plan to file bills this year to do away with the United States history test. If at first you don't succeed, try again. That's one way to describe what's happening here. Despite the recommendation of the task force, the State Board of Education voted to keep the U.S. history test, saying members expressed concerns that the removal of the assessment could lessen the importance of U.S. history in schools. Miles makes this note. We're not trying to eliminate United States history. We're not trying to eliminate any kind of history classes. We want to actually let the history teachers teach history, but not to have to teach that standardized test. 
Jamie Ann Jackson, WCBI News. Now, if the legislator votes to approve a bill to do away with the U.S. history exam, that path would not need approval by the State Board of Education. Well, the North Star Industrial Park in Octibaha County is getting the attention of some developers. Today, Golden Triangle Development Link CEO Joe Max Higgins spoke about the progress being made at the park and proposals for future projects. Higgins is asking city and county leaders to consider building a TVA pad, a spec building, and investing in a $1 billion project called Project, project Trinity. Funding for the TVA pad and spec building will come from the existing bond revenue from the park. Higgins says they are still looking for money for Project Trinity. The TVA pad project is 100,000 square feet. In a perfect world, we'd find a company to come in, want to take the pad and build a building of at least 100,000 square feet on it and employ people. We think that advanced manufacturing would go there. Uh, the spec building, which is next door to it, that'll be, that'll be you know, that's a, that's a building that's built. doesn't have the interior built for it. So, but, but everything's there. In other words, the roof's there, the walls are there. You come in, you finish the building out like you want it. And then on the, on the bigger project, it's looking down at the west side. It's just a huge capital investment, uh, uh, good pay. Uh, but probably the winner there is the capital investment that it makes and the taxes it would pay to the city and the county and the schools. Garen Manufacturing is set to move into the new industrial park. Higgins says they're also in the process of building a sign entrance and a water tank at the park. Both of those are expected to be completed by the end of the summer. And another area getting attention in Starkville is the city streets. Alderman approved the next step in building a multi-use path connecting the town and Mississippi State's campus. The first stage is a wide sidewalk and a two-lane bike path on Loxley Way that opened to walkers and bikers just a couple of months ago. Our Bobby Martinez was in Starkville today where he learned the goal is to make getting from point A to point B as smooth as possible. I can remember not that long ago when people were going sidewalks to nowhere. It is a priority for Starkville Mayor Lynn Spruill, making transportation for students and residents as smooth as possible by offering multiple ways of getting about. Because as you well know, you know we're looking at autonomous vehicles in, the, in our future. We're looking at uh, bicycling. We're looking at scooters. We're looking at any numbers of ways for people to get around. Change. That is something Spruill says she focuses on when it comes to remodeling the city of Starkville especially when it comes to the infrastructure. Well, it's a quality of life issue for us. And so students, millennials, the kids that we want to come to school and then stay here are find sidewalks and pedestrian access and bicycling and that sort of thing, very attractive element to a community. It's also important for uh, retirees. Ada Dickey says she uses the downtown sidewalks all the time. I really enjoy walking my dog, especially in the downtown area, because there's sidewalks on both sides, and there's not a whole lot of traffic or anything, so we always have a smooth and easy walk where we can just walk up and down the street about two miles or so. It's especially easy now. Uh, I'm also a big bike rider. I like to walk around a lot, and I've really noticed that the city of Starville has taken more of an initiative to kind of provide some more pathways and walkways for bikers and pedestrians as well. So it's a lot easier to get around that way. I'd say it's pretty cool just because it promotes fitness and also just getting out there, um, you know, love the beautiful Mississippi weather. So might as well take it in at some point throughout the day. That was our Bobby Martinez reporting there. Now, Mayor Spruill also says she has a lot of projects that will take place this year that will help with the city's infrastructure. And turning our attention over to weather, Keith, is it true that I hear we have rain in the forecast? More rain. Mm. Love it or hate it? I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> After the weeks we've had, Quentin, yeah, we certainly don't like it. Uh, we've also had some chilly days here, four days below 50 degrees in a row here in Columbus. That hasn't happened since last March, so we've been spoiled with some warmth, but we have the rain coming our way. We'll talk about that next. Your WCBI First Alert AccuWeather Forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. So great to see you this evening. Shout out to my aunt and uncle up in Michigan passing along this picture of their dog Tootsie right here. She's very happy. She is a chocolate lab, loving life up there. Now, she would probably love the warmer weather down here. It's been pretty cold up north of late. Uh, do have the umbrella for us here. Your 
yourself, your four-legged friends. If you're going out for a walk in the morning, we will see some showers around here. Temperatures in the 40s for our day Thursday. Right now, radar is picking up on a little bit of rain out here towards Bruce and Newport. I think all of that is staying in the cloud cover. We do have some showers trying to actually get to the ground out in Indianola, Greenville, the Delta right here. And that is likely coming down to the ground just a little bit. We have dry air protecting us, but the dry air is shrinking as this moisture comes on in. The moisture will win out and we will see the rain come on in here. Dew points will be going on up. These lower numbers illustrate the dry air. And as they shoot back up into the 40s tomorrow morning, that just means the atmosphere will be saturated enough to produce some rain. And we're still thinking anywhere from about a quarter of an inch to maybe over an inch. So this is not going to be like the last couple of events where we had two, three, four, five inches of rain, but still some nuisance rain in the region. We just don't want to see any more rain after what we've been dealing with here. So let's check out your off insurance camera network in Columbus, Tupelo, Vernon at Durham's Pharmacy where we are at 39, 40 in Louisville, Mississippi tonight. So temperatures in the upper 30s to around 40. We are looking at widespread 40s here in the region tomorrow. Umbrellas needed in the mornings. Uh, keep those close at hand during the late morning into the afternoon. We do have more rain coming our way. No real chance for thunder here. No strong or severe weather. Just some rain showers. Temperatures in the 40s. The rain will really get out of here tomorrow evening. Cloud cover will be hanging around for our Friday. A mix of sun and clouds. And depending on the cloud cover situation, 40s or or low 50s here. We'll hope for the best, but we'll just see how it all plays out. Saturday is looking very nice, mostly sunny, 54, 52, variably cloudy on Sunday. So that system on Sunday is likely going to stay just to our southwest. We'll watch it though. Uh, another one here for the middle of next week will, will uh, give us a chance for more rain here. Another front's coming our way. So we'll watch those two systems after the one that's coming up tomorrow. Here's your AccuWeather Weather 7 day, 46 tomorrow, 52 Friday, 50s for the weekend as we talked about, and a little bit milder, Quentin, as we get into <laughs> next week, upper 50s to lower 60s. Remember, Keith, a few weeks ago I sat in this very seat talking about how we're going to just skip past winter. I was sadly mistaken, wasn't I? We were close, and then winter's like, nope, I'm I, coming back down said, to the hold deep up, south. Hold up, wait a minute. Y'all thought I was spinning. Old man Winter wanted to come on down and visit us again. Here he is. Here he is. All right, yep. thank you so much, Keith. We look back on the life of a groundbreaking comic actor a little later in the show. Stay with us. You're watching WCBI News at 10 with Quentin Smith. Welcome back. RSV is a serious respiratory virus that affects children mostly before the age of two. Tonight we learn about some of the symptoms in our health talk with Baptist. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrea Morris, pediatrician with BMG Children's Clinic. What are some of the signs and symptoms of RSV in your child? Symptoms of RSV can be similar to other respiratory infections. When RSV affects the upper respiratory tract, symptoms are usually mild and resemble those of the common cold. In small children and infants, symptoms might include coughing, nasal stuffiness and runny nose, fever, poor appetite, listlessness, and sleepiness. RSV can lead to more serious conditions such as bronchiolitis, pneumonia, or both. Inflammation of the small airways can cause difficulty breathing. As the illness progresses, symptoms may include rapid breathing, coughing that is getting worse, nasal flaring and retractions, whereas the skin around the throat and ribs appear to be sucking in, fatigue, lethargy, and decreased interest in surroundings or loss of interest in food. In infants, irritability, decreased activity, and breathing difficulties may be the only signs of infection. Most otherwise healthy infants infected with RSV do not need to be hospitalized. In most cases, even among those who need to be hospitalized, hospitalization usually only lasts a few days and full recovery occurs in about one to two weeks. Join us next time for Health Talk with Baptist when we will discuss when to call the doctor and the treatment for RSV. Mail your topic suggestions to Health Talk at WCBI.com. Health Talk has been brought to you by Baptist Memorial Hospital Golden Triangle. If you need something to do this weekend, how about this? WCBI's 27th Annual Bridal Showcase and Fashion Show. Doors open at 10 o'clock Saturday morning with the fashion show starting at 1215. Tickets are only 15 bucks and they're available at the door. Now, if you're planning your big day, Saturday is the day to take care of some of the big items on your wedding to-do list. For more information, just visit our website at WCBI.com. 
Well, the Bulldogs are beginning to turn things around in SEC play. We'll recap from tonight's game against Arkansas after the break. WCBI Sports with Courtney Robb. After a tough start in the SEC, Mississippi State chipping away to get back in the win column, which continues tonight against Arkansas at home. And it was all going down in Stark Vegas. The Dogs versus the Hogs. Early in the first half, forward Reggie Perry finds guard Robert Woodard on the arm and one. MSU takes a 9-3 lead. Midway through the first, forward Jontel Sila with the three-pointer off the fast break. Bottoms and Arkansas goes on a 13-2 run to take a 16-11 lead. And right before the break, Bulldogs with the steal. Guy Tyson Carter out in transition, bringing it right to the cup in the finish by Perry. The Bulldogs up 30-26 at the break. Second half, bring on more Perry guard. Nick Weatherspoon finds Perry the and one bucket. Bulldogs up 39-33. to and move way through the second. Perry again with the ball, owning the paint off the miss with the two hand tip slam. MSU up 46 to 40, but the Hogs not going anywhere. Razorbacks in transition. Guard Jalen Harris right to the rim for the jam. Makes it a three point ball game. Stay able to close down the stretch. Weatherspoon finds guard DJ Stewart. Talk about leaving a man in the dust. It's a 10 point Bulldog lead. Finishing up a fantastic game in style. Weatherspoon with the ball out to Woodard. And the finish with the Dunkaroo. Mississippi State wins its third straight game, defeating the Hogs 77 70. Bulldogs back to 500 in SEC play. WCBI Sports' Tom Ebel joins us live from the Humphrey Coliseum with more. Hey, Tom. Courtney, a big reason why Mississippi State is on this three game win streak is because of the reigning SEC player of the week, Reggie Perry, becoming the first Bulldog in at least the past 20 seasons to record three straight 20 point, 10 rebound games. And it's something about Arkansas that maybe Perry wakes up for. Perry originally was committed to Arkansas before flipping and coming to Mississippi State. A lot of the guys who suited up for Arkansas tonight actually played AAU ball with Perry back in his high school days. When asked if indeed Perry does wake up and is a little more ready for the Razorbacks, Perry says, nah, I'll just treat him the same as I do everyone else. I try killing everybody I play. <laughs> To be honest, but you know it's always fun playing against people that um, I played with in the past. Y'all probably see me talking a little bit, um, but that's normal. But you know what I'm saying. Um, talking a little bit more tonight, just because I knew those guys. But I just try getting the team win and dominate. You gotta go to them every possession. I mean, ain't nobody doing nothing about it. I mean, it's simple. We're going to them every time somebody do something about it. And if they dig, you know, we gotta be ready to shoot. He opened up so much stuff for us, so, I mean, it's just simple. His teammates are doing a great job. We're getting him the ball. I mean, our percentage of times we score or get fouled when he gets the ball is, you know, really high. Uh, now, not just with him. I mean, he passes. I mean, you know, we got to keep getting the ball down there. There's just no question. Mississippi State on a roll, three straight wins, and they'll need Reggie Perry and the team to continue this ex this up. Uh, much better style of play for the next couple games. They'll go on the road to Oklahoma on Saturday as part of the SEC Big 12 Challenge before jumping right back into SEC play, taking on the Florida Gators on the road. Reporting here inside the hump, Tom Ebel for WCBI Sports. Courtney, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Tom. Amory's start to the season may have been cold. However, now the Panthers are heating up. Amory, now the winners of eight straight games. Head coach Brian Pearson saying it's no coincidence that the reason behind the team's streak is players settling into their roles. And that starts with junior point guard and floor general Jamerson Martin. Our athlete of the week was the best player to touch the floor in the Monroe County tournament. In three wins, Martin had 11 points against Hatley, 40 points versus Aberdeen, and 21 points in the final against Smithville. Martin saying the key to his performance, he was simply in the zone. Everything was just clicking, and I felt I just got hot, and my teammates just kept me, kept me striving, just told me just keep taking my shots, so I just listened to my teammates and just kept taking my shots. I watched Kentucky a lot, and I just watched the point guards. I watched guards like my height, so 
when it's my time to play at college, I know what to do and my performance and stuff. Martin and the Panthers attempt to keep the streak intact as they travel to Nettleton on Friday. Quentin, mm. you also watching Kentucky a lot to work on your form or? Uh, not really. I'm watching Mississippi State. Oh, okay. Mm. Or some Kansas. Kansas, Kansas, but we don't want to talk about Kansas. No, we right can't now. do that right now. As a true <laughs> fan, they embarrassed me last night. Ooh, okay. All right, thank you so much, C Rob. We'll have a last look at your forecast when we come back. <laughs> Terry Jones, a member of the groundbreaking British comedy troupe Monty Python, has died. Jones, along with Eric Idle, John Cleese, Michael Palin, Graham Chapman, and Terry Gilliam, changed the face of comedy across the world when they formed the group in the late 60s. Jones appeared in the TV series Monty Python's Flying Circus and films including Monty Python and the Holy Grail and The Life of Brian. He directed The Life of Brian and The Meaning of Life, as well as the post-Python Eric the Viking. In later years, Jones also wrote books and narrated documentaries, many of them centered around ancient and medieval history. He was diagnosed with dementia and aphasia in 2016. Terry Jones was 77 years old. Weather-wise, we are watching the rain gradually encroach upon our region, have the umbrellas uh, ready to go tomorrow. We have rain in the forecast. We'll clear it out just in time for the weekend. So once we get past this rain, we got some good weather this weekend. Uh, Saturday's looking great. I like it. How about you, C-Rob? All good with me. We love it. Have a good night, everyone.